in the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA09. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. I can go ahead and check things ask off, and then we can head can straight to the banter land. All right. Exciting. Welcome to Doom to Fail, the podcast where we cover two stories, one historical, one true crime, about things that are doomed to fail. I'm Farz, joined here by Taylor. Hi, Taylor. Hello. And we are, we're just discussing how we're such a jet-setting podcast group. The most jet-setting. I'm I'm in California at the moment, and then I'm going to have dinner with Farz in Texas later today. And then I'm leaving for Seattle the next day. Gross. I mean, Taylor, cool. I don't love Seattle. You don't love Seattle? Why, why do you not love Seattle? Um, It's like, I don't, it's dirty, it rains there, and um, I was really disappointed by the, um, what's it called? Space Needle? Oh, yeah, like, yeah, that's not. That's like, go nothing. to Las Vegas and see the stratosphere. That's, like, way better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't even know. I think Seattle, I might have been to Seattle at this point like 180 times. Like, I'm over it. Yeah. I I could see the value the first 10 times I went, and now it's just like another place I have to go. So I only went once, and it was for your wedding, and it was fine. They had really good um, pizzole, which is not a, a Seattle dish, but I just happened to, to go to a Mexican restaurant and have really good soup. <laughs> really? Which restaurant? That's all I got. I have literally no idea of ours. It was like... A million years ago. I don't when when but... I even get married. I got married seven years ago. <laughs> I know I was pregnant with my my beautiful boy, but other than that, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I need to send you suggestions for where we should go get dinner tonight. Yay! Excited. Unless, you have, downtown Dallas. Unless, unless you have preferences. I absolutely do not. Okay, then we will. I will figure something out. I, I... What do you, cool. Um, cool. So, okay, let's go ahead and kick things off because you got to scurry off the airport um, and I got to get about doing life stuff. So you go first this time, I think, right? I do. Yep. Okay. So my drink is going to be an espresso martini, which I think I've done before, but it just feels like an espresso oh God, martini. Kind of a, it, do I always say espresso all you martini? Drink, all you drink is espresso martinis. Like They're that's so all you drink good. now. It's weird. So How many good. calories is an espresso martini? Um, I don't want to know. Great. I'm happy for you that you love them so much. I found this one place in Austin that does a really fun one, which is they take, they have a nitro cold brew station. So they fill nitro uh-huh. cold brew and then pour the liquor in on top of that and then put little powdered sugar and stuff. Oh, it's so good. So rich and delicate. You're going to die. Pregnant. It's like a four logo. It's I know. Good for you. I know. It's like diabetes. It's really bad, but it's delicious. <laughs> awesome. Well, great. Um, that that's exciting. Um, mine <laughs> is an Astoria cocktail, which I just picked because it was number one on the list of the top cocktails in nineteen fourteen. Because my story ends in nineteen fourteen. Um, so the Astoria cocktail is one dash of orange bitters, um, two thirds of a jigger of Tom gin and one third jigger of French vermouth. Um, so it's like a martini with orange bitters. Sounds lovely and old timey. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is too. Um, okay. So I will go and get started. So I was in New York last week and I was like, there are so many people here. I don't know what to do. Like I saw more people, maybe I said this, but I saw more people last weekend than I've seen in like six years. That's right. Physical people. Um, And then I was like, oh my God, there's just so many people. Then I was thinking, what if I didn't do a person this this time and did something else instead? So I looked around New York City and I was like, what else do I see? And I saw a pigeon. So today we're going to talk about the passenger pigeon. Do you know anything about the passenger pigeon? Is is it, it? It's a generic pigeon that was trained, right? Nope. Wow. So okay, it's a species of pigeon. Um, yes. Okay. Well, interesting. And it it is, and so we'll get into it. But it is it is extinct. It no longer exists. The passenger pigeon. No. It's one type of pigeon. Um. Yeah. It's a sad story. It's really weird. Um. So, another thing that happened when I was in New York. Let me look at this right now. So there was this. 
I was on the street um, and there was a woman and she was like um, looking at a bug and taking a picture of it. And then she like really dramatically stomped on it. And I was like, that's weird. But then I like let it go. And then later I got, like, I saw an article, I think in the New York times, there's this bug called, a, I think it's a spongy moth. It is a moth and it is red on the inside. I believe it's this one. And New Yorkers are, and they told everybody in New York to kill them on the spot. Spongy moth. Yeah, it's like red and blue. I don't know. Oh, maybe lantern flies. Is it a lantern fly? It's a lantern fly. Okay, wait. Now I'm back on the New York Times. Um, there's a lantern fly. And anyway, they're like red in the middle. They're actually kind of pretty, but they're, they're invasive pretty. and they can hurt plants and trees. Yeah, but like you're supposed to kill them. But it was just so weird to see a woman like, frantically stomping this red bug on the street and I was like what is that but anyway I know that, I that, that is a weird level um, of aggression to like just witness randomly it was just yeah I was like it's so weird to be like they're really everyone pretty. in the city kill these bugs they are but they're bad but they're baddies they're trying mm. to trick you I guess anyway that just I thought about that but so Farce I want you to imagine that it's 1813 and you are hanging out with your good friend John James Audubon. And John James Audubon fucking loves birds. You've heard of his society. Perhaps. I've heard of the Audubon Society, yes. For the longest yes. time, I thought it had so, to do with cars, and then I learned better. Oh, yeah. I am um, my Porsche on the Autobahn. Yes. The, yeah, because totally it sounds like sense. Audubon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. Um, so James, John James Audubon loves birds. And he loves birds in a natural history is new kind of way. So like a pre Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's like born a couple decades later. Um, but he loves it in like a rich dude way of loving natural history. So when I was at Hyde Park to bring it back to, to FDR and um, in the Roosevelt's, there are cases and cases of birds in their house, like just like, behind glass like these birds that FDR himself killed stuffed and like cataloged you know like that was like a pastime for these like rich rich young boys and they like wanted like his dad was like you can do it but like make sure you're cataloging it you know what I mean like don't just like shoot these animals for fun like do it in like a scientific research way which is ridiculous um it's just like not not ridiculous but like weird <laughs> Well, that, yeah. no, I, that that sounds familiar. Do you remember the um the two kids, the rich kids who wanted to commit 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 the perfect murder? Yes, yes, yes. Leopold and Loeb. Yeah, yeah. Did one of them, too? like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, I think one of them, his stuff ended up going into like the Museum of Science and History or whatever. Yes, I remember that, and they won't tell you who, which ones are his because people would get mad. Exactly. <laughs> I remember exactly. that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so exactly. So it's, I think it's weird because it's like a rich guy and a really rural guy's hobby, right? It's like I just picture like a dude in the middle of like Texas and like a small town killing birds. And I also picture like Teddy Roosevelt killing birds. There was, a, all the there was a weird, so. there's a weird overlap between like the rich and the poor where like hobbies yeah. eventually come back together. It's just like in different orders yeah. of magnitude. One is yachting in the ocean and the other one is like, hunting alligators in the swamp <laughs> exactly exactly um so yeah fdr he gave the rest of his birds to the natural history museum and and i saw them like that the day after i saw them at his house and i think it's so interesting this has nothing to do with pas passenger pigeons but he had a really special thing where fdr knew his place his place in history like he knew that his home was going to go to the public and be a museum sometimes i think about like what if i like roped off my office and people would like look into it and be like oh this is where taylor had an office you know what i mean is that interesting? we are going to be famous enough to where that will happen to us yeah anyway so Teddy Roosevelt did that as well. Um, he escaped into nature a lot when he was sad. Uh, I don't know if you if you know this, but Teddy Roosevelt's mom and wife died on the same day, um, and it was terrible. And he kind of disappeared into the wilderness. Um, he went to school, and everybody was like, "This dude is weird because he has all these dead birds in his room." You know, just like something that they did. Um, but before them, um, Audubon is drawing birds and killing them but drawing them very beautifully you, if you look at his his images they're, they're beautiful he does, does beautiful wildlife paintings and, and drawings um so 
again, it's 1813, and you and JJA, John James Audubon, are on horses riding through the plains of America, like they're in the Northeast. I don't know exactly where. And I'm going to read you a quote, and it's pretty long, but I'm going to read you the whole thing. So imagine you and him riding horses out in the in the woods in America. Got it? Same page. I can't see your face, but I feel like you're like, yes, I love this. Okay. So here's what he said. On a horse. I dismounted, seated myself on an on an eminence. Okay. I'm sorry over. I dismounted, seated myself on an eminence, and began to mark with my pencil, making a dot for every flock that passed. In a short time, finding the task which I had undertaken impracticable, as the birds poured in countless multitudes, I rose, and counting the dots then put down, I found that 163 had been made in 21 minutes. I traveled on, and still met more the farther I proceeded. The air was literally filled with pigeons. The light of the noonday was obscured as by an eclipse. The dung fell in spots, not unlike melting flakes of snow, and the continued buzz of wings had a tendency to lull my senses to repose. I cannot describe to you the extreme beauty of their aerial evolutions. When a hawk chanced to press upon the rear of the flock, at once like a torrent, and with a noise like thunder, they rushed into a compact mass, pressing upon each other towards the center. In these almost solid masses, they darted forward in, un in undulating and angular lines, descended and swept close over the earth with inconceivable velocity, mounted perpendicularly so as to resemble a vast column, and went high, were seen wheeling and twisting within their continued lines, which then resembled the coils of a gigantic serpent. Before sunset, I reached Louisville, distance from, from Hardensburg, 55 miles, and the pigeons were still passing in undiminished numbers and continued to do so for three days in succession. That is a very posh way to describe a murmuration. It's a shit ton of pigeons. It's a shit ton of pigeons. Yeah. Um, what he was seeing was like probably a billion passenger pigeons. They would fly overhead for days and days and days. Um, so right now in America, we have billionaires, you know, and people, have you seen those graphs where it's like, how do you conceive a billion dollars? You know yeah, I mean? yeah, it's it's orders of magnitude that are like so dramatic that your brain can't comprehend. Exactly. So a million seconds is eleven days. A billion seconds is thirty-one years. You know, like it's just so much more. So like a billion passenger pigeons is like eight times as many regular pigeons as we have today. Like so many fucking pigeons. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Um. So that was in eighteen thirteen, where Audubon is seeing them in the air. The they're flying over you for days and days and days. Um, in 1900, the last passenger pigeon was killed in the wild. And in 1914, 101 years later, after that account, the last passenger pigeon, Martha Washington, died in captivity at the Cincinnati Zoo. Wait, what year? So, 19 what? What happened? 1914. Uh, that's why you said 1914. Got it. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's when, that's when Martha died. So... What happened? They, how do you go from like a billion of something to zero of something in, in such a short amount of time? So the passenger pigeon lived in North America from the Great Lakes down to Mexico. They were probably always there um, in these huge flocks. They also were in smaller flocks as well. It wasn't like they didn't have to be in the huge flocks, but most of the time they were. Um, they were there were so many pigeons. I feel like I wrote so many pigeons in caps so many times in this outline because there's just so many fucking pigeons. Um, they would like come and roost in a tree and they would break the tree. They would be on every branch of the tree, you know, and the trees would break. Uh, so oh, I also, there was a, um, there's like a thing, a meme I saw like many years ago, but it was like, God gives birds the gift of flight. And the pigeon says, no, thank you. I'll get there by walking through the Home Depot parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, but um, so they, there were so many passenger pigeons that would snap trees when they would land. I mean, of course, because you have like a billion birds like landing on a forest, they would like destroy the forest, destroy the trees. Um, they were together in those big groups, you know, to keep their numbers up and to stop predators from attacking them. Um, they also left behind a lot of bird poop. Of course. So in of that course. quote above, it's like when Autobot was like, it's falling like the snow. That's fucking disgusting. And then they would leave like up to a foot of 
bird poop on the ground after they were done, like nesting. Just they're so really gross. pretty. They're really pretty. They're an elegant pigeon. They don't look elegant. like they're not like they're like more dove like than current pigeons that you see like that's yeah. When a dove is a pigeon. Is it really? But yeah, it's like so they're 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 more genetically similar to like the morning dove, um, which is also a pigeon. Oh wow. It's like the same this is I I got a little bit into genetics a little bit later, but like yeah, it's like there's the same like you know family or whatever. Oh yeah, the Columbidia family is doves yeah. and pigeons. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Um, yeah. So the dove gets the good rep and the pigeon gets the bad one. Um, but so they would so they do these big fox. They poop all over the ground. Um, sometimes it helped the land. Sometimes it didn't. As we know, like land needs to rest. Um, so that's why there's like you know burning of land and you have to like rotate your crops and things like that. So sometimes it helped. There was a little bit. Sometimes it just would destroy land if there was a ton. Um, they um, are you were talking about what they look like. So um, what's rare for this type of bird is they have um, sexual dimorphism, which means the male and the female look different. Um, obviously we see that in like um, Lions peacocks, and... like you know, that like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We see that in like all sorts of animals, but um, usually not in pigeons, but in the passenger pigeon, they were different. Um, they both had um, black feet and oh, they had red feet and red eyes. <laughs> which is terrifying, red yeah. eyes, black beaks. Um, and then the, the man would, ha- the male had a, a, a red belly and the women's women's, the whatever was gray. So the that's the, red and gray. I know. I'm like, what am I even doing? The female was gray. So um, they, you know, they looked a little bit different. They ate nuts and seeds and berries. Farmers didn't love that. So now we're like farming the land. Cause obviously they lived on the land with like native um people for you know centuries and then um they farmers would be like oh they're eating all of our um you know all of our seeds they eat some acorns but not like terrible they could eat insects if they wanted to um if they like had to but not but not a ton um animals would you know eat them obviously they had natural predators but like they didn't even make a dent like an eagle isn't going to kill a billion passenger pigeons right you know um but you know who is going to kill a billion passenger pigeons people people and you know why we killed them food swab yeah they were delicious yeah that's um, so gross they me. were delicious that's yeah. like eating that's like eating rats I know. because i'm so used to la pigeons it's just like i know oh, God. once you've seen one you're like oh my god and so did you watch i can't remember did you watch succession i've seen bits and pieces so their mom so obviously it's about their, it's about their dad but their mom there's like there's so much like symbolism in it, I'm sure. But their mom is like this like British woman who's very, very thin. And she has this thing where she like doesn't, well, she hates her children and she's like pretty awful, but she doesn't eat very much. And she like does things like they come to visit and she's like, oh, I didn't bring, I just didn't buy a lot of food. I figured you wouldn't want to eat, you know, stuff like that. And she, she'll be like, oh, like she hates her oldest son. And she's like, why don't we just like do have this conversation while we're eating an egg later? And then she like doesn't show up for that egg eating but at one part of it she's like oh i'm so glad you guys are here i all of our pigeons are here and she's like little pigeons like cooked on the table for them to eat just like little birds and like nope. the, the kieran culkin is like ew like mom fuck you like it's just really funny because like she's just gross and like she just like has this gross relationship with food and anyway that's the last time i saw someone eating a pigeon <laughs> Sounds succession. yeah that does not sound um, at all. yeah but they're delicious but also they're small so like you can eat a couple of them before you get full you know like it, they're not like a turkey there's like a, it's like very little meat on, on it um they were easy to hunt because there were so many of them there's like le- legends that you could just like put a stick up into the air because they would fly low and just like stab one you know kind of like a reverse stabbing a fish in the water yeah it's like they would there were traps they would set the um the trees on fire to make the passenger pigeons all fall out of the tree. Um, they would burn sulfur underneath the trees and they would fall. So you could kill like tens of thousands of them at the same time. And um, with the, with like the advent of the railroads, um, you could eat a, a passenger pigeon, you know, in the country and in New York city at a fancy restaurant, you know, they were like everywhere. I mean, they must've been good um, if you were trying to eat them that badly. 
Yeah, I mean, it, I think it felt like a unlimited resource of meat. Right. You know? Um, very little meat, though. So, I'm looking at pictures of it, and it's like... Yeah. Very little meat. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's not... They're not... Exactly. They're not like a turkey. Um, so they were... The population probably had ebbed and flowed for all time. Um, the passenger pigeons that like we know of that we like saw um they had low genetic genetic diversity so we talked about that a little bit when we talked about the volcano which means that like something happened and then they were all from the same like pool of pigeons so they could have had like a big group of them and then it could have gotten down but they were from like a small a small group um but then it, they grew to like this huge group pretty quickly um in this time like, up until the 1890s there's no regulation on wildlife in the United States. Like you can do whatever the fuck you want, you know? Um, then in 1913, um, a little bit later, there's a, an act called the Weeks McLean act. And that said that you couldn't hunt during mating season. Cause you needed like, they're like, okay, we're like killing a bunch of animals. It's like not good. And we're not giving them the opportunity to like have more babies, you know? That's good. Um, also both the passenger pigeon and other birds, and I've heard of, I can't remember where I heard this, but um, a lot of birds were close to extinction or went extinct because um, during this time, it was very fashionable to put feathers in your hats, like for real. And they would kill birds just for their feathers, you know? We're so wasteful. Um, I know. So um, they had to stop doing that as well. So um all kinds of animals are being, you know, obviously like ruined by by people being here um, and seeing them. Um, in the early 1900s, the last passenger pigeon was shot in the wild, um, and in 1895, Martha, the pa- the last passenger pigeon ever, she was born in Chicago at like a uh, in the University of Chicago. There was a professor who was, you know, trying to um, understand the passenger pigeon. She Martha is an endling, which is the last of your species, which is like such an amazing, terrifying word. That's um, so sad. She, yeah. So she, there were some like um, they brought some males with her. She ended up she didn't have you know they they didn't mate. They tried to find a mate for her. They were like, we'll give anyone a thousand dollars if they could find a mate for her out in the wilds, and like no one could. Um, and she died on September first, nineteen fourteen. And as soon as she died they froze her in a block of ice and sent her to um a a lab to like try to like understand like what you know what she was like and then they took a bunch of pictures of her did a bunch of stuff and then they um they skinned her and you can still see her she's stuffed in a museum um so she was the last one and then you know that was it so imagine like you have all of these something is everywhere and then it's nowhere like literally nowhere in in the 100 years so the question then is like what's next for the passenger pigeon because there actually can be a next because there's people who want to bring it back from extinction which is something that's technically possible so in 2013 so about 10 years ago this was like a big thing people were talking about there was a tedx um, like symposium called de-extinction about like bringing you know other extinct animals back besides the passenger pigeon just like what we could do with that and I listened to I listened to some podcasts for this so oh, I didn't tell you my sources but I listened to some podcasts um, there's a book that I did not read but I wish I would have um, it's called a feathered river across the sky the passenger pigeons flight to extinction but I also listened to a podcast with um, called back from wait I don't know what the, it's called but Oh, sorry. Grow Everything Biotech Podcast um, with Revive and Restore. And um, the dude that works there, his name is Ben Novak, but he was talking about, um, he did a TEDx de-extinction talk. And one thing that they want to do at Revive and Restore, which is where he works, is, you know, bring back, um, you know, animals that are extinct or also save animals from um, extinction by cloning animals and like helping them, you know, breed faster. Um, Also, I listened to like several podcasts and it took a very long time for anyone to mention Jurassic Park, which I was very disappointed <laughs> with. Because like we know that this is a bad idea, technically. Um we also know but, how to do it. You just find the mosquito first. Yeah. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um it's a little bit different with um birds, which is actually funny because birds are dinosaurs, <laughs> now that I think about it. But um 
it's easier to clone a mammal than it is to clone a bird because of like the way that the eggs are like having an egg inside a body is easier than having an egg outside of a body with a shell for genetic reasons um but so they've been cloning so they they had this idea that we're going to clone the passenger pigeon 10 years ago everyone was really excited about it all these books came out they ended up they didn't do it um and they didn't do it I think because there are other things that are more pressing. So there's animals that are so close to extinction that we need to save them somehow. So on December 10th, 2020, they cloned a black footed ferret. Her name was Elizabeth Ann. Um, So it's the first time that a U.S. endangered species was cloned. And so they can do that now with um, with mammals. They also uh, cloned a horse. It's called the Preswalski's horse. And what they're trying to do with that is restore genetic diversity in the horse population. So they're just like making more horses so that they can like breed and then they'll have more and then they'll be able to, you know, not be extinct. So they're not extinct yet, but they um, were on the path to being extinct. Does that make sense? Yeah. I've so, never heard of this ferret, um, the question, and I didn't know the world needed more ferrets, but it's uh, it's still cool. Well, so that's the question. Like, what do we need and what don't we need? You know, like, do we need more ferrets? I mean, whatever, probably not. But also, like, should we not let animals go extinct? I feel like that answer is yes. Like, we should try to save them if we can. Um, I also think that, like, well, we talked about this a little bit when I talked about like the genetic diversity of humans after the um, volcanic eruption of Mount Toba. So they looked back and they can say, oh, we're all from this population that survived 70,000 years ago. And they also found the same in like pandas and lions. Like they also had the same like genetic bottleneck and we know that. But the reason that we know that about those things is because they're cute. You know, like who gives a shit about an ugly animal? We want to know about cute animals. So we are, you know, cloning these cute animals because they're the ones that we would be like most sad if they went extinct. I don't know, That's man. Have you, going on. have you seen a California condor? They're fucking disgusting looking. Yeah, but also have you seen like them fly? Yeah, I've have not seen, seen the them. bird show at Okay, I have you think... seen the bird show at the LA Zoo? I cry every time. No. It's amazing. Is there a condor there? It's in- incredible. Yes. Okay, so the um, last it's condor it's like, went extinct in the wild in 1987. That's wild. I think they yeah. But then we're, be, we're able to like save them and bring them back, which I think is so cool. And like, honestly, if you ever go to the bird show at the LA Zoo, it's like so beautiful. And you're like, can I dedicate my life to birds? Like, it's like really, they do a really good job. It's really nice. Um, so yeah, well, yeah, they're trying to like save these animals. Oh, this is where I also like um there was a bald eagle at the big bear zoo that I saw recently, and she was blind because in like the eighties she ate a fish that had been poisoned with DDT Ugh. from like a thing. So like so I mean, those are the things you're like, yeah, we should fix that, because that was our fault you know and like same with the passenger pigeon like that was 100 percent our fault um if we brought them back what would happen we have no idea like what would they be like in the wild um you know would they be there's like a, a, a thing where they can like put passenger pigeon dna and also in this in researching this they talk about how about junk dna and that just blows my mind that like most of our dna is junk that like cannot be true I don't know why I like don't believe that so hard, but I'm like, how can it mean nothing? It's crazy. But so they can put passenger pigeon DNA. They don't really have, oh, they don't have the DNA. They have like a little bit of like tissue from like an old one because it was like a long time ago, but they can, if they put it into like another pigeon, it's something where like that pigeon would have to continue to have babies and those babies have babies. And then out of a hundred thousand, you might get one actually genetically perfect passenger pigeon. You know, well, it's like a whole thing is wild. So they're like, you know, they're working on that. But they don't know what it would be like in the wild. Would it be? Do we need a billion pigeons flying around? Probably not. You know, but also like, should we try to have some pigeons? Also, like, I know this is silly, but like, what would they be thinking? You know, like this is weird. No I mean, one around here is like me. I don't think it's... Or they it, don't they think? It's not like... Well, no, because it's a new thing that comes back. So its only frame of reference is what it sees today. It doesn't have, like, 
right. markers from like the 1800s to understand that its ancestors, this is like a hundred year gap in its ancestry, you know? Right. Totally. But also like, what does it know how to, what does it do instinctually, you know? I think probably what any pigeon does, right? It flies, forms Yeah. these large Walks plots around the Home and Depot parking lot. Yeah, Yeah. it'll probably, it'll probably just run into your windshield like you would just be a stupid bird, right? Like it's not that complicated of an organism. I was looking up, this one's really sad, the um the rhinos. Like there's a picture of like Uh-huh. the last rhino that died in um his name was it was a boy, it was a male named Sudan and it was in Sudan and there's it was the So last sad. northern white rhinoceros and it had 24/7 armed guards that like walked around with it because of poachers. That Oh. shit is like heartbreaking. It's like, Dude, that wow, makes me sad. like the very last one. It died in twenty Totally. eighteen. That's so sad. Yeah, I feel so sad for Martha. You know, like I feel so sad for the whole thing. But like the good thing, the good news with that rhino, at least, is that we can't, because it died so recently, I'm sure that they have tons of its like genetic material frozen somewhere. So there's a thing called biobanking where you keep. cells and tissues from animals and you freeze them so you can clone them later so as technology catches up with like this idea it should potentially get easier and easier and so there's people like revive and restore this, this organization who have these like huge things there's like a frozen zoo at the san diego zoo where they have all of this tissue of and cells of these animals so that when they can clone them they will be able to you know Oh my God, you're right. um Dude, they created three embryos. So that was the last Mm male. They had two females somewhere in captivity and they were able to generate three embryos in 2019 since -hmm. Mm the two remaining female northern rhinos are not suitable to carry pregnancy. Oh, they're going to implant the embryos in a southern white rhino as a surrogate. It's, it's just so crazy to me. But like, I think, but I think like to your Wild, point, like right? how do you decide what to do and what not to? I think when it's all human driven and it's all because Yeah. of us, then yeah, like it's not Yeah. their time to expire. We forced it on them. Right. Exactly. So try and It's bring not them back. like, you know, yeah. So, um, yeah, so that that's where we are right now is, you know, the passenger pigeon is on the list to try to clone and bring it back to life. We'll see what happens. I know people want to do some of like the bigger ones, like the woolly mammoth, like that seems kind of fun. Um, also, I was going to say, please don't clone dinosaurs because it's not going to turn out well. Oh, my God. Taylor, we are so in different camps. I'm so going to be in the pro-clone dinosaurs camp. Have you seen what happens? We've been through this Every like seven dollar, times. every dollar you donate to an anti-clone of dinosaur camp, I'm going to somehow crowdfund ten dollars to give to the pro-clone of dinosaur camp. I'm so Good. into, Fine. into this. And I will I will also put a dollar into a savings account for your funeral when you get eaten by T Rex. I, and I would be the first one. I would definitely be one of the first ones. Yeah. So worth it. Oh my god. So absolutely worth it. I got to stop looking at pictures of the rhinoceros. Yeah, it's sad. It's sad. Yeah. So, and also another thing that was in this when listening to um, Dan from Revive and Restore talk about it, he was saying that like he's like pro zoo, which is like so funny because like I feel like there's you know people who are on the like animal. I love animal sides where they're, they're like they shouldn't be in captivity, but also like they need to be in captivity to be studied, you know, and they're animals, so like. There's, you need to be able to have a, a fair amount of them in captivity to be able to be studied, to be able to understand like what they need in the wild, to be able to protect them better. We have to understand them, and you can't really understand them if they're all in the wild, you know. So some part of the population always needs to be, in 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 his opinion, and and I think I agree in in some sort of captivity, just so that we can like understand it, you know. Oh, man, it, it really, in my opinion, depends on, like, where they're in the zoo. Like, if you go to the old L.A. zoo, like, that Sure. was horrific. Well, of course, it's not nineteen hundred. Yeah. Or, or when you hear about, like, the Yes. animals in, like, zoos in Syria where, like, everybody has to flee and now all these animals Yes. are just, like, locked in cages waiting to die. Like, it's, like, like you know, yes, San Diego should have a zoo. But that Yes. might be Okay. it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. No, totally. That that's right. I mean, obviously, like, yes, of course. There's like those places in like Asia where you can like. sit with a monkey for like a whole day but like it's really bad for the monkey Right, <laughs> right, yes exactly. i get that
writing elephant like, but if you're doing it like tourists, the right way putting tourists on top of like elephants, elephants in india like so that they can take their fucking right. honeymoon pictures like that's gross yeah no 100 percent. i agree um yeah that's it that's the uh, the short story of the passenger pigeon because we don't know what they were like before and it's another thing it's another thing just like i think last uh, episode with the weather changing from mount tambora where they like ask the oldest person that they know like weren't there more of these <laughs> you know and then yeah. like yeah they used to darken the sun and you're like interesting they don't do that anymore you know like i only see a couple and like you kind of like you didn't if you just like you know were born in you know 1900 you didn't know, know the magnitude of what was lost but right. if you remember it and it happened in people's lifetimes you know like i used to see this thing all the time and i don't and i see it now never like that's wild yeah yeah and it's funny living in cities it's like you don't even really think about it because the only animals you see are like the gross pigeons or like disgusting oh my god because so many rats in new york yeah yeah Ugh, god. yeah Ugh, so it's so weird how um, like yeah, that, that like nobody values can like persist and like be completely unkillable and then you have these beautiful rhinos that are just whatever it is it's life i guess i know um sweet well taylor thank you for sharing and the we can go ahead and you know cut this off unless you have listener mail or announcements to make i do i have listener mail and it is from me because i'm an idiot and i just want to share this with everyone so I sent an email to everyone I fucking know, asking them to subscribe to our podcast. My first few hundred emails got zero traction. So I was like, maybe I'm just like writing a bad email. Maybe it's people don't remember me. I don't know. So I ran it through ChatGPT and then made it, made it a little jazzier. And then I sent that email. But in doing that, it broke all the links. And I didn't test it because I'm an idiot. And I know that's email 101 is to test your emails. And like, I used to get so worried about emails and like messing them up. And then like this time I was like, I don't give a shit. I'm just going to do this. I'm really excited about this. I want to share it. And then it took like eight days and Nicole is a freaking hero. And she's the only person who told me that the links didn't work. And I was like, oh, I was like, obviously, thank you so much, Nicole. And so I emailed everybody again. I said, my links are broken. Here's new links. And since then, we've gotten a couple um, more email signups. Two people, um, Robin and my mother-in-law, Lily, have um, pledged that if we ever want to start charging for our our podcast, they would they would pay for it, which is very sweet. Um, and yeah, so we have a couple more people who subscribe to our newsletter. Um, if you want to do that, please do. It's in our link tree in our in our Instagram at Doom to Fail Pod. Um, but I will send an email every Friday with um, our, our our shows from the week. So our Monday show, our Wednesday show, and then on Fridays I'm doing um, a bonus episode. So I I'm usually doing a um, dividing up some of our older episodes and doing them a little bit shorter. And this week I interviewed the author of where they burn books they also burn people which was super fun so that's up now as well so very cool send very for cool. emails so you don't miss anything um a, a rare a rare self-written email into our email address which is great <laughs> attraction <laughs> we'll take it <laughs> um but if you do have other feedback or suggestions it's doomed to fell pot at gmail.com please do write us we do like it it's awesome. fun we love it. Great. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and cut this off. And the next time you hear us, it will be Wednesday. Awesome. Thank you.